tonight at 7. We've learned the Amtrak train that derailed in Philadelphia was traveling at twice the speed limit when it went off the rails. Seven people were killed. Several more remain in the hospital tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm Leslie Foster. And I'm Bruce Johnson. Derek McGinty joins us live right now from Philly with the latest on the deadly derailment. Derek. Well, Bruce, Leslie, I'm here on Frankfurt Avenue, just really several hundred yards away from the crash scene itself. And I want you to take a look right across the street here where you can see the NTSB and other authorities hard at work. Just a few minutes ago, tractor trailers pulled what they call portable light packs into that area. That means they plan to be here as the sun goes down and perhaps well into the late night hours as this investigation is intense and it's going to go on for some time now. NTSB officials a bit earlier described their conclusion so far as preliminary, but they are also described as robust. So here's what we know so far. The NTSB does say that train, number 188, out of Washington, D.C.'s Union Station, was going about 106 miles an hour when it hit that curve last night, a curve rated only for 50 miles an hour. As of right now, another body was recovered from the train today. That brings the death toll to seven, and as of tonight, Eight people are still in critical condition from that accident, and they're in Philadelphia hospitals. The NTSB says Amtrak train 188 was traveling in excess of 100 miles per hour when it entered that curve where it derailed. The agency says further calibrations are still being conducted. However, maximum authorized speed through this curve was 50 miles per hour when the engineer induced brake application was applied. The train was traveling at approximately 106 miles per hour. The train's black box has been found and is being sent to Washington for more analysis. The passenger cars and the locomotive will be moved to what's being described as a secure location shortly. All right, we're live here back again on Frankfurt Avenue. Now we should note that I know you want to know, what did that engineer have to say about what happened last night? He has not yet talked to investigators. In fact, they tell us today he has lawyered up instead. Investigators do hope to talk to him in coming days. In the meantime, we can also tell you that the Federal Railroad Administration did inspect those tracks recently. They found nothing at all wrong with the tracks. So this goes on tonight, and again, no defects in those tracks. Now, we should also tell you the train had uh, forward-facing cameras, which could hold more clues about exactly what happened. We are going to go now, a lot of details developing tonight. Our Deborah Alfaron is going to pick up our team coverage, and we apologize for the distractions behind us here. Deborah. Thank you, Derek, and certainly this is a story that kind of hits you in the gut. Situation is that many of us take the train from New York City to Philly to D.C., and if you don't, you may know someone who does, but certainly all the people that live around here, they know what it was like to be here and to hear it and to see it. They just covered him over. She was like, you don't want to walk down there. You know, it's, it's bodies everywhere. Tuesday night's plunge into chaos and darkness gave way to Wednesday's search for passengers and answers. Searchers looking for passengers still not accounted for. What we do know, the NTSB says emergency brakes were applied before the crash, and they also say the train was traveling at 106 miles an hour when it entered the curve where it derailed. The limit in that stretch, 50 miles an hour. The NTSB says they haven't spoken to the engineer yet of Amtrak train 188, but they hope to. You're looking at video the NTSB just released, giving us a firsthand view of what investigators are seeing. Iwina Washington, who lives right here, says she'll never forget what she saw last night. I see them coming out with stretchers and people having, you know, all types of injuries, shaking up, bloody faces. It was kind of like walking dead. And certainly uh, that woman was very nice in spending some time talking to us. And she was sitting on her stoop and she shared exactly what she saw. It has certainly affected her. Now, of course, NTSB investigators, they're going to be here for quite a while. And they actually are going to have their next press conference. And that'll be tomorrow, they say. Certainly we're going to be here live throughout the night and have updates for you here on air and also online and on our app. But we're going to send it right now back to Derek and see... Uh, what's going on with right. you, Derek? Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much, Deborah. I appreciate that. As we can note, some of the neighbors are, are nicer than others around this part of town. Um, I should tell you that uh, investigators are still trying to track down all of the passengers who were on board that train last night. And if you know somebody or you have questions, there's a number to call. It's 1 800 523 9101. Family members can call the number if you want to check on your relatives. There's also a family assistance set up 
uh, center that's been set up at the Marriott Hotel, 12th and Market Street here in Philadelphia. Well, within the hour, we did learn that a former Rockville resident, sadly, is one of those seven victims in that crash from last night. Abid Jelani lived in New York. He was a senior VP with Wells Fargo, and previously he worked with Marriott in Bethesda. He was 55 years old. He was in town for his uncle's funeral. He was on the Amtrak going back home to New York. Jelani leaves behind a wife and two adult children. Now, we know that uh, besides those fatalities in that crash last night, there were 200 others injured in the crash, some of them far more severely than others. Several of them were hurt, are being treated at Temple University Hospital, and that were, that's where we right now find our own Scott Broom, who's been there for much of the day. Scott Broom? Well, Derek, among the many lucky ones, survivors who walked out of this hospital treated and released today was a D.C. resident. We'll talk to him in a moment, but first let's talk about these catastrophic injuries. What happens to your body when you're on a train that goes off the rails at 106 miles per hour? A few moments ago here at the hospital, we talked to the medical director, Dr. Herb Cushing. I was surprised at the number of rib injuries that surprised me in, in the relative uh, few uh, head injuries. Um, and I think we were fortunate that there, were, there weren't more deaths. The more speed, the more force you've got. Um, so it, it did not help, certainly. Among the lucky survivors leaving the hospital today, a D.C. resident, Caleb Bonham, a 28-year-old web editor. Uh, I am very blessed uh, to be as safe as I was compared to pretty much everybody else on that train. Um, there was a lot of people that are hurting on that train. We were tipping and um, chairs were all over the place. Uh, everything sort of just broke down inside of the train. Everybody on that train was helping people. Um, there were there were some older people on that train that needed a lot of assistance and uh, you know, people stepped up, there's no doubt. Other survivors echoed his recollections of passengers helping other passengers first. Like, I'm still here, I'm still walking. I, I got really lucky. This is a nightmare. I saw so many head injuries and, you know, bloody um, faces. Back here live now at the Temple University Hospital. Dr. Cushing told us he expects a, a number of the 23 people still at the hospital here to be released tomorrow, but some of the people could be kept up to six or seven days. 23 people here, eight of them critical, and this is just one of six hospitals that treated victims of this train tragedy after it happened last night and are still continuing to treat them today. That's the situation here at the Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia. Scott Broom reporting. Let's go to my colleague Stephanie Ramirez with some thoughts about some of the victims who did not make it. Now, Scott, we know two people are missing. We do have, though, at least three people identified here. I'm outside of the Associated Press's D.C. offices near L and 13th Street Northwest, where they are mourning a beloved colleague here. We also know a midshipman, a 20-year-old uh, from New York, who was studying in Annapolis at the Naval Academy there, has passed. And now today, as you know, a third victim has been identified, B. Jelani. We confirmed with his Rockville family through a colleague there speaking with the family that he leaves behind a wife, a son, and a daughter. A 55-year-old Wells Fargo senior vice president is the latest victim identified in the Tuesday fatal Amtrak wreck. The first victim to be identified was 20-year-old second-year U.S. Navy Academy midshipman Justin Zemzer, his mother speaking out today. He was a loving son, nephew, and cousin who is very community-minded. This tragedy has shocked us all in the worst way. Photos of the two appear all over her Facebook page showing a mother extremely proud of her son. Also a victim, 48-year-old Jim Gaines, the father of two and Associated Press video software architect who was on his way home to Plainsboro, New Jersey from meetings in D.C. Many people throughout our region now deeply grieving and trying to come to terms with this tragedy. It really drives home the fact that Every moment is precious and we should try to grab our arms around life as we have it. He was absolutely wonderful. Everybody looked up to my son and there's just no other words I could say.
The third victim identified, uh, as we know, Jelani was in town for his uncle's funeral and headed back to his home in New York. His family in uh, Rockland, Maryland, now mourning and deeply grieving. We also spoke to a lot of people today who were uh, more fortunate, were able to find their loved ones who got off the train with injuries, but they are alive. Those people are breathing a sigh of relief today, but they're also offering their deepest sympathies and condolences to all of the victims involved here. I'm Stephanie Ramirez in North Northwest DC. I'm going to give it back now to my colleague Derek McGinty, who's over live in Philadelphia now. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Terrible, terrible tragedy here in Philadelphia. Seven lives lost, dozens, perhaps scores of lives changed forever, and the NTSB now trying to clean up this mess. I'm drawn back to the words of the mayor, Michael Nutter, who said this is a disastrous mess and he's never seen anything like it. Well, again, the NTSB is likely to try to clean it up or at least find out what went wrong. No more press conferences scheduled for tonight as far as we know. They do expect to come back, back at us tomorrow, perhaps around the same time, maybe late tomorrow afternoon. We should know what they find out then. Reporting live from uh, Frankfurt Avenue in Philadelphia, I'm Derek McGinty. Back to you in the studio. Derek, just a quick question. I heard a train expert say today that 10 miles above the posted speed limit for a train operator could get that operator decertified. The NTSB seems to be not wanting to go there. Have you heard any more conversation there from NTSB or anybody else about what it means that this train was going 106? Is that reckless endangerment or is, is well, that just a you know, little bit? Yeah, you know, that, that speed is obviously the thing everybody's looking at because it seems it seems painfully obvious to us lay people that that, that, that had something to do with, with what went wrong out there. The NTSB very, very cautious in drawing any conclusions at all except what they can tell you from the black box data, the hard numbers, 106 miles an hour around a 50-mile turn. They're waiting to talk to that engineer. Again, they say their investigation is going to go about a week. They're not, they're not here to, to, to cast blame just yet. They want to know how it happened, why it happened, and they're going to take their time and do it right. They'll know, we'll know, I guess, when they know. Okay, Bruce. Thanks, Derek. Well, thousands of passengers were stranded in D.C. by that crash. A whole lot of northbound trains out of Georgia and Florida just stopped at Union Station and ordered all of the riders off. Scores of passengers were trying to board buses to get home to New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And some of them were pretty mad about the chaos and confusion. They've called them ahead of us. Now, why they didn't say to us, get in line this first line. They said, get in be the second line. And now we're waiting for two hours where these people just came up and they're getting on the, on the bus. The NTSB has to release the crash site back to the railroads before Amtrak can even start to begin putting together a schedule for service between New York and Philadelphia. And it's not clear just when that's going to happen. We're going to continue, of course, to look at any developments throughout this newscast and the rest of the evening. As always, you can get breaking news alerts using the WUSA 9 app. Amtrak was on the agenda today on Capitol Hill, where a push to increase its budget by more than a billion dollars failed. A Democratic representative from Philadelphia offered an amendment to the GOP bill that would give Amtrak the full two and a half billion dollars the president requested in his budget. That included 556 million for just the Northeast Corridor, but the committee rejected the plan and passed another budget that would give Amtrak about a billion dollars, which is even less than this year's budget. In more news this evening, we've got a new request today following the deaths of a Rockville, Maryland couple. What investigators want neighbors to give them that could help crack the case? I'm meteorologist Topper Shut. What a difference 24 hours makes. Check out this map. This is really pretty cool. Uh, no pun intended. We are 23 degrees cooler right now than we were at this time yesterday. And 23 degrees cooler in Cumberland. We'll come back. You might be surprised how cold it's going to be tonight. And we'll look ahead to the weekend. The Montgomery County State's Attorney is now requesting outside home surveillance video from the Glen Hills community of Rockville, where a couple was murdered this weekend. Police are hoping home video has captured a suspicious person or vehicle that residents just don't recognize. 65-year-old Dick and 67-year-old Jody Villardos were found dead on Mother's Day with trauma to their upper bodies. Police say this was a burglary and the suspect somehow crawled into the home through a window. 
But we are not talking about just immediately in the area of Ridge Road. We are talking about in the general facility of a Lakewood Country Club back here in this entire community. Uh, if you have exterior cameras, we are interested in looking at your footage. There is a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. It's now up to a jury to decide the fate of the Boston Marathon bomber. Jurors wrapped up deliberations about two hours ago. They only talked for 45 minutes today. The prosecution showed graphic photos of the aftermath of the explosion, calling it terrorism and saying Joe Karzarnayev's goal was to murder and mutilate. His lawyers asked jurors to choose life for what they say was a shy kid who fell under his brother's influence. That 12-member jury must agree on one of the 17 capital counts for Sarnayev to be executed. Otherwise, he'll be sentenced to life in prison. Keep those jackets close by. Tenacious Toppers tracking a very cool start to your Thursday. You're watching WUSA 9, your only local news at 7. Always watching, always tracking. WUSA 9's first alert weather. DC's most accurate. Let's talk about the three degree guarantee. We went for high today of 73. Hmm. Held in the 60s today. The question is, did the midnight temperature save us? Ah, join us at 11 o'clock. We'll let you know. Next seven days, mid 80s on Sunday. A little, a few more storms. Still not a washout. Mid uh, Monday, we're looking at mid 80s. A few storms. Nats back in town Tuesday and Wednesday. Maybe an early shower on Tuesday and then cooling off Wednesday with highs in the mid 70s. We're about 10 minutes away from the puck dropping for game seven of the Caps series against the Rangers. That's right. With a win, the Caps will advance to the conference finals. It will be the first time in the Alex Ovechkin era. Our Kristen Bursette is at Madison Square Garden with a preview. In just a matter of moments, the puck will drop for game seven between the Capitals and the Rangers. A winner take all. They move on to the Eastern Conference Finals to face Tampa Bay. The Caps, of course, would love to do it. It'd be the first time since they've done it since 99. The first in Alex Ovechkin's career. You know, the great eight made a bold statement after the game six loss, saying this team would come back and win game seven. Well, this is the back of the New York Post today. It says Rangers big chance to silence Ovi and cap the comeback. But of course, the Caps looking to silence New York tonight. We'll have full recap coming up at 11. In New York at Madison Square Garden, Christian Bursett, WUSA 9. Recapping the latest on the deadly train derailment in Philadelphia. This is a live look at crews working on the scene. Seven people confirmed dead, two people still missing. The NTSB says that train from D.C. to Philly was going 106 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone and the engineer has not talked with investigators just yet. That's it for us at 7 o'clock. We will be back tonight at 11. Have a good evening. Bye.